Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. We're thankful for your presence. Glad that you are out with us. <clears throat> and uh, we will do some Bible study together in just a few minutes. Next week is our gospel meeting, so we will have a guest speaker at this hour. In fact, next week this time, our gospel meeting will almost be history. We'll be in the last uh, service of it. So we hope that you're making your plans and have made to come, that you have your invites and those who are coming with you already arranged, and look forward to an early beginning Sunday morning. And uh, we're excited about Brother Dearman being with us, and uh, I know that you will profit from our time together. I will remind you that all of our lessons that you'll hear are available on uh, recorded media and uh, in a variety of formats. So if you uh, would like a copy of our lessons, to be delivered to your friends or keep for yourself, then um, make a note of that. And there are some sheets in the usher's room that you can use to fill out, or you can write your the information on the back of any blue card uh, or any other suitable piece of paper and put it in a box in the usher's room, and uh, that will be taken care of. Talking to Brother Billy, uh, Sister Ruby Wilburn is still not out and about. She is struggling, and we are hopeful that she'll be recovered soon and also be able to uh, um, be home soon. I uh, also want to remember Brother Totsy Sanders and uh, David Robinson's family and David's ongoing treatment. Uh, certainly need to keep in our prayers. Let's go to God in prayer, then we'll do our study for the night. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. Father, we are thankful for the blessings of life. We thank you for providing us with what we have. We thank you for the opportunities to share our lives with our families, with friends, to be in the country that we are and have the blessings that we do. We know that those who live around the world have so many times fewer blessings and a poorer quality of life than we do or perhaps even than we can imagine. We ask that you will help us not only to be thankful but to use our opportunities as we can to assist those around us. Father, we thank you for the church at Maysville, for every member of the congregation. We ask your blessings on each of those uh, who are here. Father, we're mindful of several of our members who have ongoing issues. We ask your blessing to be upon them. We are grateful for the continued recovery that Brother Totsy Sanders is having. We ask that you will continue to be with him and help him to soon be back with us. Father, we ask your blessings on Sister Ruby that you will strengthen her and help her soon to be recovered so that she can be back with us here at church and that we can um, have the pleasure of her company. That she'll be able to have be strengthened and be able to be renewed and do the things that she'd like to do in life. Father, we ask your continued blessings on Brother David Robinson and the treatments that he was undergoing, that you will strengthen him and his family and the challenges that, that still lie ahead, and uh, that you will help the efforts of the doctors to be successful in um, returning his, his condition to a good and steady state of health. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have this coming week to spend special time in Bible study. We pray for Brother Dearman as he makes his preparation to be with us. We pray that you'll give him wisdom and remembrance of, of uh, the blessings and the scriptures that he studied, but also that you will help him to speak to our hearts and that you will help him to touch and challenge each of us with living a greater Christian life each day. Father, we thank you for the elders that watch over this congregation. We pray your blessings on them. We ask that you will help us to go through our lives faithfully. And Father, forgive us of our sins. When our time is complete, bring us home. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Isaiah chapters 52 and 53, we started or concluded our discussion last week in the uh, last couple of verses of Isaiah 52. As we begin this discussion, chapter 53 is probably much more familiar territory, but the discussion of the suffering servant actually begins in chapter 52. 
And there are just a couple of phrases that I want to make sure that we cover before we, we move along into the much more common text. When we study these passages and anything from the Old Testament, there are at least several um, areas that we are struck with at once. Number one, we're doing a study of a historical document. I know you know that, but it is important for us to refresh ourselves just how significant the fact that these things have been throughout the history of the world, that God, through the inspiration of the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit, provided the writing that has guided the church from the beginning of those who were living under the law of Moses uh, from the, at least the time of David out. We know that they were um, heavily involved in the study of this material. And uh, not Isaiah, but the things that were written uh, up until that point, they, they had awareness of all of these. And then all of the prophets that have written down and, and the prediction of the coming of the Christ and all the things that were done, all that history... A second factor uh, that is significant in our memory is that it is it was directed to a local group of people. They received it, and yet much of the material in it was intended for a future audience. That it was not for them, Peter writes, uh, that they were writing, but for us. And so we gain uh, from this. So future students of Scripture... We're also being prepared, and that's especially true in Isaiah 52 and 53. And then we have the miraculous aspect of this. And um, it is truly hard to quantify the fact that God can see the future as if it is now. You could not write a predictive statement about the future on any topic with any real degree of specificity. You might guess at something, but you can't tell me what's going to take place next week. You can't tell me what are going to be the world events six months from now or what's going to take place in a year. And yet when we have these readings and we read through Isaiah, especially tonight in our study, and we see these things that were written so clearly about the coming of the Messiah so long ago. Not just long from us, but long between the time it was done and the time of its fulfillment. Isaiah wrote these things some 700 years before they would occur. Remember that as we read through. So there, there's that, that power, that miraculous nature of the Old Testament, New Testament connection of God bringing about the plan of salvation on the part of mankind. And that's, that's fantastic. Let's go back to uh, chapter four, uh, 52, verse 14. There's one more phrase in the last half. We talked about last week, maybe too long. Just as many were astonished at you, and then we talked about all of the things that God did to Israel so that they would be looked down upon by the people. We read from several Old Testament texts. But it was done as a comparison. Just as you were troubled, so also this, this future suffering servant, will have trouble. And the description of him is, His visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. The term visage that is translated there, and you probably have, or you may have another translation, uh, is a Hebrew word which describes the form or the shape or the look of something. And so what is being described is his appearance. He was going to be um, changed, or the word marred means to be uh, corrupted, to be damaged, to be harmed. His appearance was going to be harmed or deformed more than anyone. So there's this comparison that is made. Just like you were humbled by God, so also this one will, will have tragedy, but his will be much greater. His hurt will be stronger. The death of Christ... is hard to do justice to. 
On the one hand, oh, let me, before I get into that, how many of you have seen the movie um, The Passion of the Christ by, uh, what's it, uh, help me out. Thank you, Mel Gibson. How many of you have seen that? Raise your hands. Okay, um, maybe a fourth. Can you imagine showing that in, in, in an assembly? It's pretty gory, isn't it? Uh, it's not gory? No, not, not boring. Gory, bloody, violent. Um, if you were to witness a scourging, the brutality of it would be very, very difficult to watch. The Romans called it a second death, or actually the halfway death. It could only be done on non-Roman citizens. Gentile, I mean, uh, slaves or foreigners. No Roman citizen could be punished with scourging, even if they were going to put him to death later. He still could not be scourged. It was a, <laughs> a traumatic event. The prisoner, or the, uh, the receiver of this punishment, whoever it was, would be either tied to a pole or bent over an object, a table or some other uh, thing, and stretched out so that he was um, extended, where you had no cover up. He would be stripped completely naked, and then a device would be used to, to beat him. And not when you think of a whip, we probably think of something like the, uh, the cowboys, the long a bull whip or something like this. A scourge was not like that. It would have had a short handle, and then it would have had anywhere from three to nine uh, strands of leather, which could have gone anywhere from one cubit, about 18 inches, to two cubits, about uh, 36 inches or so in length. And uh, anywhere from, again, two to nine strands, and in those strands would be embedded objects. Uh, pieces of bone, pieces of metal, uh, sharp objects which are designed to tear and cut the flesh. And then that would be applied with tremendous force against the bare skin of that person who is being scourged. Again and again and again. It would literally tear the flesh from the body. And so, th this is not a whipping. Roman historians tell us that many men died from the scourging itself. It was so brutal. Josephus described a man, and his description was, the flesh was peeled from his bones while he was being scourged. It wasn't just Jesus who was going to be scourged. There were many people. Slaves were commonly scourged and then crucified. But, but the servant here being described is going to be dealt with in a fashion that is, is truly hard for us to understand. And the fact that Jesus knew this was coming was also a challenge. Tonight we're going to spend a lot of time reading from other places. So I hope you have your Bible. But if you're not, just listen along. And I want to go now to uh, Matthew chapter 20. In a moment, when we get into uh, chapter 53, I'm probably just going to stop our New Testament, Old Testament reading for a minute and just read strictly from the New Testament for a little while. Matthew chapter 20. Um, let's start in 17. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Now that would be a bad enough prophecy or statement concerning what was to come, but he goes on. And the specificity here is, is interesting. And deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. There are times, especially on our 
Lord's Day morning, when as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, that a memory is made of the suffering of Jesus, and we speak of the shame that Christ bore. And the shame is not insignificant. The, the crucifixion itself was a shaming event. Um, not just the fact that they were going to have their life taken away, but the methodology of the taking of that life, a, a drawn out in public humiliation. Jesus was there hanging on the cross for hours as all of those detractors and those who hated him came by and ridiculed him to his face. Not insignificant. Him hanging there naked and bleeding. But the physical pain involved is also just nearly impossible for us to truly comprehend that what Jesus experienced left him so weakened that he was unable to carry his cross to uh, the place of crucifixion. And that is not uncommon. Um, one Roman historian said that uh, scourging victims almost always fainted. They went unconscious before the event was through. There was no way for the physical flesh to bear up under such pain without the brain shutting off. Now here Jesus, knowing what was coming in his life, still went through... Um, these things, and knowing about his own death. He was stripped, he was stretched, and then he was shredded even before he came to the cross. His visage was harmed more than the sons of men. And when you consider that that was something that he did willingly, that even makes it greater. All right, verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had been told them, they shall, excuse me, what had not been told them, they shall see. What they had not heard, they shall consider. What kings is being described? One of the images of the, uh, the Old Testament upon the New is the fact that God planned to call the nations, the Gentiles, into the New Covenant. Now, that is not something the Jews understood, even though we have these texts like this in the Old Testament. It wasn't even the fact that the uh, Jewish Christians of the first century understood the concept of the Gentiles coming in the church. And we see this great battle that occurs. Even though G uh, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, testified that the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and those that who would come into uh, the church, who would, be, who would repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, um, and that this blessing was to them, those Jews, to their children, their descendants, and those who were afar off, even as the many as the Lord our God will call. There, there was a testimony on the part of uh, Peter on that very first day that the Gentiles were going to be brought into the church. And yet they did not understand and fought this. And so we have the events that will unfold and for in Rome, uh, excuse me, in Acts chapter 10 when Peter goes to Cornelius' house and God has to make Peter go to Cornelius and preach to him because he's a Gentile. And then after that occurs, we have the events in Acts chapter 11. And Peter, though he is an apostle, is called on the carpet by fellow Jews in Jerusalem. They say, what have you done? We hear that you have gone into Gentiles and have eaten with them, have preached the gospel to them. And Peter defends himself by t telling all the events that happened in Acts 10. He said, look, here's what happened. I saw the vision. I was called. I went. The Holy Spirit was poured out on Cornelius just like he fell on us. Who was I to stand against God? Then the events will rise up again in Acts chapter 15. Much of the book of Galatians is about the Jewish-Gentile conflict. Yet clearly, God intended to bring Gentiles into the covenant of the New Testament. The Jews didn't understand this. And yet here we have in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 15, where God clearly writes beforehand of the kings who had never heard and yet were going to be brought in, and the people who had never heard of these things, and yet they were going to be included. And so they were. Now in the, uh, the very first statement, so he shall sprinkle many nations... The concept of sprinkling was one that the children of Israel knew well because it had to do with the concept of atonement. 
And uh, the idea of sprinkling, uh, probably, well, let, let me ask. When you hear the word sprinkling, what, does it, what comes up in your mind? Modern time. Somebody says something about sprinkling. What comes to mind? I'm sorry? A, a process by which many denominational groups practice baptism. Okay, somebody else? Okay, same practice. Do you sprinkle anything? I remember my mom sprinkling water on laundry. If you were a Jew, though, the concept of sprinkling took on a very special meaning because there was something very particular about sprinkling. It was part of the Old Testament law and had been done at the beginning, but then was, was practiced later. All right, let's go back to the book of Exodus, chapter 24, to start with. Verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Exodus 24, 4. And twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Now, watch verse uh, 5. Nope, 6. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Now, when you read that passage, especially that eighth verse, I know something comes into your mind. What is it? The night in which Jesus was betrayed, and we have the reading of there in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus says, not this is the blood of the covenant, but Jesus says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Now, the people were gathered there with Moses, and the sacrifices were made, and he took this blood. Now, obviously, he could not sprinkle blood on all of the people, but it was scattered at them. It was sprinkled at the people. Can you imagine standing in an assembly and having someone with a basin, of a bowl of blood, dipping into it a, a brushy plant, uh, sort of like a, a large paintbrush, and, and then slinging blood at you? Well, that was the image of what was taking place here. And, and the sprinkling of this blood, there was a literal um, transaction being done between the, the blood of the sacrificed animal and the people. God was applying the death, the sacrificial death of that animal to these people. And yet the writer of the book of Hebrews will later come along and say... The blood of those animals never really did take away sin. And yet God did it in preparation for the real sacrifice that would come later. All right, having read that, let's then go back to Hebrews chapter 9. Or forward, as the case may be. Hebrews 9, let's start reading in uh, verse 18. Hebrews 9.18, Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept uh, to the people uh, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in, heaven, in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place, the holy place is made with hands, 
which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, this sprinkling. Our author Hebrews says the, the same way God sprinkled the people clean and, and brought upon them the Old Testament covenant, so also Jesus now is a better sacrifice. And the concept of sprinkling the blood over the new people and the new covenant is there uh, brought as a pattern. Now, the, uh, the atonement or the concept of a, a sacrifice, a substitutionary sacrifice, is filled in Scripture. Um, and we'll identify some of that in a few minutes. Uh, a couple of more readings before we move on to chapter 53 proper. Um, back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. Thus says the Lord, verse 7, 49, 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to, whom, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people, to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves, and they shall feed along the roads. And the discussion uh, goes on from there. One other short reading in uh, chapter 55, still in Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me, hear and your soul, your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know. And nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for He has glorified you. Now, what nation would it be that, that God was talking about? Other than the Jews. He's describing the Gentiles. God will call these nations. They will come. The nations will find Jesus and the covenant will, will be fulfilled. So there will be many nations brought in, not just the Jews uh, who are going to be identified. And um, there are a couple of quotations of uh, this text or close to it in Scripture. One of those is in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 21. But as it is written, To whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard, they shall understand. Romans fifteen twenty one. speaking of Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15. And then still in Romans chapter 16, jump over to verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. Clearly, Paul says the gospel was intended, the new covenant was going to be for all nations. It was hidden. They didn't understand it. But now it's completely revealed. Okay. Question, observation, thought you'd like to share before we move into chapter 53. I want to read the whole 12th chapter. And just in one setting, you are going to be, I know you've read it before, but there are so many New Testament concepts that come to mind as we read through the text. Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed our report? 
And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. How could you write something that would more closely parallel the life of Jesus? And how written so long before, unless you saw what was coming in the future? There are several um, observations I want to make about our text, and obviously in the time we have remaining, we can't cover uh, these items verse by verse, and we'll not try to do all of that tonight. I do want to make a couple of observations, especially about the, the first couple of verses, and then I want to do a collected reading of New Testament passages. In the, uh, the first question, who has believed our report? This this idea is going to be found a couple of times uh, in Scripture. And uh, one of those um, is found in John chapter 12. And I'd like to go and read that one first. John 12, 37. But although he had done so many mere, uh, signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said, now watch this 41st verse. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. When we apply... Isaiah chapter 53 to Jesus. We're not doing it arbitrarily. The scriptures themselves said these things were about the Christ. And John says Isaiah saw these things about the Christ and his glory and the experiences that he would suffer and wrote of them. So we have this reading. Now to what degree? What did Isaiah know? We've asked that before. I can't tell you what he knew. All I know is that he wrote these things Clearly. Paul will again use that terminology in Romans chapter 10, verse 16. Who has believed our report? 
To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The concept of the arm of the Lord is uh, that the strength of God is being shown. Now, obviously, God does not have a physical arm that He shows. But in the Old Testament, that was one of the um, ideas that was commonly used to describe God's power when He demonstrated it. He rolled up the sleeve of His arm descriptively in bringing Israel out of the, the land of Egypt in bondage. God said, I will show my arm, I will strengthen my arm against Pharaoh. With a strong arm, God brought Israel out in His bosom. The statements are made um, concerning God's work in the Old Testament. But um, after that, verse 2, He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant, out of a, a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. If you've ever had a tree that got blown down and had a uh, something come up from the roots, you understand what it is like or what is described as a, a root sending forth a shoot. Now, if you've got a living plant, it may be that you've got suckers that come up. But, but after you've cut it down, even in, in the dirt, there can be the remains of a plant, and that, that plant will come up. But you know, as a rule, that's not a very attractive-looking plant or bush. You know, you plant a tree there uh, with, its in, with the intent of allowing something to grow up. It, it looks good, but if you've, if you've cut it down, and then later on you've got uh, some part of it that, that regrows, it's not very attractive, at least not at the beginning. It may live, but it's, it's really not what was intended. And here's this description. In, in a place where you would never expect something to come up, in, in a dry area, you've got this, this root that, that appears. And so there are going to be several concepts here. He's going to be unexpected. Um, you wouldn't expect this to come because we have this root in dry ground. He is going to be unprotected. There's going to be no care given to him. Undesirable. There's no form or comeliness when we see him. Some have used this to say that Jesus himself was personally ugly. When you see artist renditions of Jesus, can you tell when you see a picture that it's supposed to be Jesus? Shake your head like this. Or Have you ever seen a picture which you knew was supposed to be Jesus? Now, how is Jesus depicted, typically? Handsome. Distinguished features. Chiseled jaw. If they show the whole body, he will be... A large guy, barrel-chested, broad shoulders, good-looking fella. I've seen the ones where there has a picture of Jesus coming out of the grave after the resurrection. Looks like a Roman gladiator stepping out. He's got pecs popping out, and, and he looks like he's you know could be one of these Roman statues. That was not what Jesus looked like. Well, what did he look like? Well, I don't know. But he wouldn't have been somebody that you would have thought to have been physically beautiful. He wouldn't have been one of the good-looking people. He came from a place where nobody cared about him, Nazareth. In fact, uh, after uh, Andrew goes and finds Nathaniel, he said, Come, I, we have found the Christ. It is Jesus of Nazareth. And you know what Nathaniel says? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth. See, we don't think of Nazareth as a... As a backward town or a bad place, but they did. That was, that, was a, that was a nothing. It was a little village up in the hills of, of Galilee. That's not where the Messiah is going to come from. We're going to get the Messiah from one of the, the lines of the kings. He's going to be a great man. He's going to be something special. No, he's not. Isaiah warned them in advance in Isaiah 53 too. You're not going to like this guy from the way he looks. He's not going to come along the expected path. You're not going to be drawn to his eloquence. You're not going to be drawn to what he looks like. You're not going to be drawn to where he came from. There's going to be nothing about him that would draw an attractive group to Jesus. He has no form that you'll find good. And then he goes to begin to describe what happens bad. 
despised, and rejected. Let's, um, let's go read from Matthew chapter 13. I'm trying to gauge my time with the clock. A, a constant battle. But let's, let's go to Matthew 13 first. Verse 54. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brothers jo James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. John chapter 1, verse 10 Jesus is described, He came to His own, but His own would not receive Him. But to those who did receive Him, to them He gave the right to become the sons of God, who were born again, not of blood, not of the will of man, not of men, but of the will of God. Here Jesus comes back to His hometown, and when He preaches to them, isn't the one place that you would want your, your people to take um, to have some advantage it is your own hometown, your own people? Over the years, I've read of several uh, businessmen who grew up and who established their manufacturing or their company in a hometown where they grew up because they wanted their, their family, their neighbors, their friends to benefit from their success. So they'd build their factories there and allow these people to have their jobs uh, with them and, and help them to profit. Now Jesus wants His own hometown, His own people, to have this the wonderful contact with the Messiah, the Savior of the world. We as humans find some fascination with having grown up with celebrities around us. And over the years, I've met several people who uh, knew famous folks. Um, while I was at school at Freed Hardeman, there was, uh, I had a friend that I spent some time with, and she had a housekeeper um, who had uh, a family connection to Elvis Presley and had spent a great deal of time in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, with Elvis's family, helping them, working among them. And um, she was proud of it. She was, she was something of an honor. Wouldn't the people who grew up with Jesus consider that to be an honor? But they did not. I don't know how much of this we get to read. Let's start. It's all in order, so you won't have to turn as far. Let's start in Matthew chapter 8, and we'll just go as far as we can. Matthew eight sixteen. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be spoken which was that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. But when he knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Luke chapter 22.
Here I'm interested only in a single verse, verse 37. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. I would love to spend some time talking about that. and The, the awareness that Jesus said that the prophecies are going to come to a fulfillment. These are all going to wrap up. There, there's an end of this. But we need to move on. Luke 24, verse 25 and following. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. John 1, 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 36, And he looked at Jesus and as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. We'll end on this, this next one, Acts chapter 8. In a reading that we have done several times, but since we just read it a moment ago, Acts 8.32. Uh, pick up verse 28. Uh, he was sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet, when the Spirit said to Philip, Go and near the chariot and overtake it. So Philip ran and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation... His justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Perhaps next week, that we gather for our class, we'll be able to read some more of the texts that clearly represent Isaiah's work in the New Testament. Thank you for your time and attention. Next week, as you will remember, Lord willing, our meeting will be taking place, and then the following week we'll continue our study for just a couple of weeks, and then uh, our summer series will begin. Thank you for your attention tonight.